I'm going to be talking about perpetual crypto funds, how to fund ideas that can live forever. So I want to go back in time to 1790, and Benjamin Franklin gave $4,000 to the city of Boston and Philadelphia. And he had a very important stipulation on this. He said, I'm going to give you $4,000, but you can't touch this money for 100 years. So for the 100 years, this money was just sitting there, accumulating and growing. And then for the next 100 years of the fund, they basically spent on activities in the city of Boston and Philadelphia. 200 years later, the fund had grown to $7 million. This is the best performing fund of all time. And today I'm going to talk to you about how perpetual crypto funds allow anyone else to do the same. Go from $4,000 to $7 million and make a big impact on society and show you how others can do the same with perpetual crypto funds. So first of all, what are perpetual crypto funds? So basically, perpetual crypto funds are funds that are basically built to last forever. And the reason that this is possible is because of three unique properties of blockchains. First of all, they're deflationary. So a good blockchain, a good cryptocurrency is going to have a limited supply or a tokenomic such that the supply is going to increase or decrease at a very fixed amount over time. So it holds its value over time. Two, staking. There's an investment yield that's basically built into the blockchain system itself. So you don't have to take on risky investments and have to trust a centralized party to make investment decisions. And finally, smart contracts. Smart contracts basically means no more arguing, no more fighting over decisions. The code is the law, and transparent and immutable fund governance makes things easier. So first of all, why are perpetual crypto funds important? Perpetual crypto funds are important because long-term planning is important. Very often in day-to-day -day life, we're so concerned about making it through the next one or two days, one or two years, we don't think about 25 years from now. You know, what was the last time you thought about what are your kids going to do 50 years from now? You know, maybe you're 50 years old, you think, who cares, I'll be dead by then. You know, we're living longer and longer lives, so if you're 50 years old, if you're 20 years old, you probably want to be thinking about what is society going to look like in 2000, 2010. So I'll give you an example, and I'm, I really like the slide, I made it earlier today. Let's say you've graduated from school and you're about to start working. And so you're 25 years old and you start a pension fund. And so, you know, all things being equal, ceteris paribus, you're going to retire at the age of 65. And now let's say that you pass away life expectancy 85. So between the ages of 25 to 65, you're contributing to your pension fund. And from 65 to 85, you are distributing your pension fund. So that means you need a fund that's going to last you 40 years. And most pension funds today, most endowment funds, are not set up for this for a couple reasons. First of all, fiat currencies, which is what we all, most of us use nowadays, actually we all use fiat currencies, even if we don't want to, um, they lose value over time. So this chart right here shows you the amount of supply printed by the U.S. Federal Reserve government in the last this is actually only, yeah, it's only about um, 35 years. And so you can see, you know, roughly, roughly, roughly around the same amount. And then in, 2000, in 2020, in the last year or so, the amount of money basically tripled in the span of a year. Okay, who cares? What does this mean? This is like macroeconomics. Who cares? Boring stuff. Yawn. This is what it means. Oh. So think back to the example I gave earlier on about how <clears throat> you need something to last you 40 years. Well, so if you needed a fund that could last you 40 years, but the amount of money is basically doubled in the space of a year. What this actually means is that the value of your dollar is decreasing over time. So 30 years, so you, know, you need something to last you 30, 40 years. In 1985, a dollar is worth about 228. And now it's about worth a dollar. And so what this means is that if you save the set aside money, I'm going to put aside some money, and I'm hoping that when I retire or when I want to send my kids off to school, this money is going to be there. Actually, it's not going to be there. If you set aside $10,000, it's worth $4,000. If you set aside $1,000, it's $400. And so this is like a fun chart to show you that basically what a dollar can get you over time. The other problem with fiat is the same problem with all other human endeavors. Greed. People get greedy. People start to, both for money, for glory, and they start to make very, very risky decisions. Let's start with the Howard Endowment Fund. So Harvard is... A university, but it's pretty much like a huge hedge fund because they have $36.9 billion in their endowment fund, the world's biggest endowment fund. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, around the 2008 financial crisis, Harvard almost got margin called. And basically what margin call means is that they basically borrowed money to make investments, and, the investor basically about, and then the, the people they borrowed money from was about to seize their assets. So you have to ask yourself, 
what business does the university have doing having a $36.9 billion, but also being in the position of being liquidated? And the reason for this is that they hired a bunch of really smart, quote unquote, smart people to do this thing called the Harvard Management Club. So they were investing in things like real estate, private equity funds, derivatives, just super, super risky investments. And they basically almost got to a position where they basically almost lost all their money. And uh, there's a little funny joke. So there's two interesting things about this. First of all, the president of Harvard University, the man who actually does the day-to-day -day operations, makes $1.1 $1 .1 million. The person who just basically moves money around makes $15 million. So the person who actually runs the university that makes Harvard worth $36.9 billion makes $1.1. $1 .1. The person who just invests that money makes $15 million. And it's kind of funny, because I was thinking to myself that, you know, you could have just given me that money, I'll throw it in an index fund, and I would have done better than this guy, and you don't have to pay $15 million. So there you go. So we learned a lesson, right? Like, we've learned to stop using people's risky life savings to make risky investments, right? We'll never do it again, right? Uh, well. I want to say November 2019, no, November 2019, November 2021, yeah, 2021, October 2021, um, the CPDQ, which is the largest, second largest, hedge, second largest pension fund in Canada. So this is pension fund, this is Quebec's pension fund, the province of Quebec. This is people's life savings, police officers, teachers, everyone's. They decided to make a high yield investment in a certain cryptocurrency lending platform called Celsius. And I think you guys all know how this ended. Yeah, so they filed for bankruptcy the other day. So this $400 million is probably down to almost zero. And I love how this comment put it so poignantly by saying, oops. But it's a lot more than oops, right? This is people's pensions funds. This is people's life savings that we're talking about. And again, these are, these are funds that they should not, they're, not in the, they're not in the business of making high returns. They're in the business of making slow and steady returns. You want it to last you a long time. So there's some more reading about this. If you're interested, you can scan the QR code. So the other problem is that funds have opaque rules. And what ends up happening when you have an opaque rule governing something is no one is really clear on what that means. And like, so if I say, I want to spend, I want to give $1,000 every year to support an underrepresented group, no one can decide on what an underrepresented group is. No one can decide when it's a good cause. You have people that are arguing all the time. So for example, when um, Benjamin Franklin did his, they wanted to spend the money on a party. 200 years later, they wanted to spend the money on a party. He also set a rule that he wanted to do only men who are married in farming. And you know, maybe 19, in the 1790s that made sense, but 20 years later, years later that didn't make any sense. There's another great example of this man called Peter Thelison. And so he was inspired by what Benjamin Franklin did. But he did something very different though. He said, okay, here's like, I think it was like 400 million pounds or 400,000 pounds, which was like $61 million at the time. So he said, okay, I'm about to die. In my will, I'm giving $61 million to my descendants. But there's a catch. And the catch is, none of this money can go to any of my living descendants. So this money, $60 million, I'm going to put it aside in a fund. All of you that are my descendants that are currently alive, none of you can touch it. However, the next generation, when they're alive, then they can start distributing the fund. Now, one of the people who was supposed to get this money was so upset that they actually shot a portrait of him. You know, so that was just like, because they were so upset about this. And then even what ended up happening with this was that this went to court and people were sort of like, no, if, if we leave this money to last for too long, it's going to take over the world economy. Eventually, everyone's going to basically be paying this man. Similar thing happened with another man called John Holdeen. Again, what Benjamin Franklin did was so powerful that many people tried to imitate it, but they couldn't. He tried to do the same thing and this ended, wound up in court. And 92 years, after he passed, 92 years after he passed away, this thing was still in court and it only finally ended because the last living member passed away as well. So, you know, this is kind of a thing where in society where, like, when, when the laws are in contracts or phys, um, human contracts, it's very subjective. You get a lot of arguments. And the final problem is that funds have opaque flows. So, you know, I th around sometime last year, there's a big controversy around them. United Nations, tax the billionaire, tax the rich, all that stuff. And so, basically, someone was saying that um, if Elon Musk gave 2% of all his money, we would solve world hunger. Then Elon Musk said, you know, probably the world's richest troll said, um, okay, fine. If you give me an audit of exactly where the United Nations is spending its money, I will give, you know, I will, I'll sell Tesla stock and I'll do it. The president of the United Nations replied saying something, something, you know, six billion won't solve world hunger, but we've done an audit, et cetera, et cetera. Blockchain solves all this. And I'll show you how later on. So as you can see, there's a lot of problems with the current um, funding systems. Now I'm going to talk about how perpetual crypto funds are better. So the first thing is that deflationary cryptocurrencies hold value over time. 
So a lot of us probably take inflation for granted, right? We probably just take it for granted that if you keep some money in cash, obviously it's going to lose value over time. But this was not always the case, right? If you think back to the oldest form of money, can anyone guess what it is? Starts with a G? Gold. Yeah. So if you think about something like gold, gold has been around forever, and it's pretty much held its value relatively well relative to inflation. And you know, this is why we now have cryptocurrencies, which is sort of the digital gold. So Bitcoin, 21 million will only ever be, will only ever be printed, so that's deflationary. And even something like um, Ethereum, which does have um, increasing supply, based on the fee burning mechanism and stuff like that, it also has a limited supply, so it tends to have deflationary po um, it tends to have deflationary properties. So this means that you can basically have a fund where it's, let's say, $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, and you can be pretty rest assured that 10 years from now, 100 years from now, that fund will still hold its value. The other thing that's really good about this is that stakings offer um, better risk-adjusted returns. So recall earlier on that you have all sorts of people running around trying to make money, making risky investments, and very often they lose the money. They'd better off be just putting in an index fund. And sort of that's what essentially staking is. So the benefit of staking is that the yield is well known, and also it's not decided by a centralized party. You know, for those of you who follow economics, you probably know every once in a while Jerome Powell, central bankers decide, you know, what the interest rate should be. But with Ethereum, no one is deciding it. The community decides that this is what the interest rate should be. And also the return is directly tied to the security of the underlying blockchain. Similar to a treasury bill, for those of you who know what a treasury bill is, but now instead of it being done by a centralized party, it's underlined and secured by the entire network. Yeah, and so you can sort of see like this is how like it fluctuates the Federal Reserve rate fluctuates over time. And again, it's all decided by central parties. And finally, my favorite thing about this is that ex explicit and transparent smart contract logic. So this is a smart contract code from Open Zeppelin. It doesn't really matter what this is. The core point about this is every single person knows what the rules are. So if you say, I want to set up an escrow fund, every single person can go and look at the smart contract and see this is what happens when you deposit. This is what happens when you withdraw. First of all, it's completely transparent and it's immutable. So this means there's no arguing, there's no lawsuits, there's no suing people, there's no fighting, there's no wars, more importantly. Everything is just done by the blockchain. So remember back when I said, when Elon Musk demanded that United Nations perform an audit of what they do? Well, with stuff like Gitcoin, for example, that's done automatically. So Gitcoin is a grants program that basically gives, people to, gives money to people who work on open source software. All their grants funding, you can go check that out on Etherscan, it's automatically audited. So you never need to ask them to audit anything. And you're not, even, not only do you not even have to ask them, with a traditional audit, you have to trust that maybe people like accounting firms or law firms are not lying. All of it is automatically audited by the blockchain. And then, so this is an interesting book called um, John Jones' Dollar, and where, he, where basically it's a, it's a book written in 1914 about what happens when a dollar is left to, I think, to compound for like, I think, was it 100 or 200 years? And they were so worried that like about compounding for such a long period of time that, you know, basically what happens is maybe you have a world in which a few billionaires sort of own all the money and control society. But what ended up happening was they called it an interplanetary socialist paradise. Now, setting aside socialism versus capitalism, but the idea that you have more money to invest in society is generally a good thing for everyone. So how would you make a perpetual crypto fund? So there's a couple of steps involved in this. You want to, first of all, determine your fund goals. What is important to you? What do you want to fund for society? Then you want to basically do what's like a simple practice round, right? Before you can do something that lasts 100 years, why not do something that lasts one year? Then you want to have the, write the fund rules. And then start contributing, and then finally start funding your perpetual endowment fund. So first of all, what are the fund goals? So when it comes to the fund goals, you want to think about what's important to people, what's important to you, you want to, I recommend giving directly to people. And finally, you want to pick something that can last a long time, but is flexible to changing over time. So for example, when Benjamin Franklin wrote his, he said, 25-year-old man married, I think had to be in a trade. Again, in 1790, maybe that made sense. But in 1990, a completely different society, you want to pick something that sort of can be flexible enough to last over time. So things you can fund, um, scholarships and grants for students, that's personally what I recommend, because that's what my company does, so you can do that. Um, grants for people building retroactive public goods funding is another really great one that I really like. And then finally, interest or interest-free or prime-only loans, I think is another great option. You can sort of loan people money for um, maybe starting a business or something, and then they just have to pay interest or 
interest, um, interest only, which is prime. So when it comes to writing the fund rules, um, I really recommend doing a Gnosis, multi, um, Gnosis chain multi-sig wallet. And basically what this means is that you have basically, you, have this, you make a rule that says, before, the, before you spend money on anything, five out of nine people have to sign through on the money funding. And you also basically send spending limits that says, only maybe you can only send out maybe $5,000 every year. And again, this is all done on chain, so there's no debating, there's no arguing, there's no yelling about all these rules. And then, so yeah, some, some stuff to, um, about start contributing. So yeah, so you can start contributing. You don't have to do this alone. You can make this a social activity. You can do it with your friends. You can do it with your family. And then you contribute to a fund, and then you stake the fund. So another benefit about this is that you don't have to trust a centralized party for making investment decisions. You can use things like Lido. You can use things like Rocket Pool. I personally recommend Rocket Pool. And so basically, you have a staking that's, again, no central party. You don't have to pay a hedge fund manager $50 million a year or even 220%. You just put in the smart contract, and it starts yielding for you. And then you can start distributing the funds. So there's a, there's a lot of options. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of options for you to distribute your crypto donations or, or your funds once you're ready to do it. Gilcoin, I recommend um, they do open source software. Attila, that's the company that I founded. We do scholarships and grants for students. Um, give directly, retroactive public goods funding in the giving block. Those are all really good um, charities that just support like, cryptocurrency donations as well. So forever is the goal, today is the first step. So I know I'm talking about 50 years from now, 25 years from now, people are like, dude, I'm just trying to get through the next year. But I think, and that's fine. So I think if you want to start small, you can start with a crypto fund that can last you for a year, and then you see where things go from there. And then if you're like one of those people that you're sort of maybe overwhelmed by all the information I presented today, but you're interested in this, um, Attila, my company, we like, are very passionate about this stuff. So we specifically focus on scholarships and grants for students. So let's say in the future you say, okay, I've, I've raised some money. I want to I support students. That's what I care about. I want to do a scholarship or a grant for a student. Then you can basically reach out to Attila, and then th these are the sort of things that we do with our endowment funds for people. And one of the biggest reasons I, I like perpetual crypto funds is that they make us optimistic about the future. Um, I think a big problem we face today, today in society is a lot of short-term thinking, right? And it's understandable. You know, we're so worried about the next year or rent, things like that. You know, how often do you actually take the time to think about, okay, what kind of society is going to, what kind of society, what kind of legacy am I going to leave 25 or 50 years from now? But once you sort of, you know, commit a certain amount of money that says, okay, I want this to last for 100 years, automatically you start thinking more about the future, and automatically you become more optimistic about the future. And yeah, so perpetual crypto funds, I love, I love it because they allow us to live life. They allow us to leave an impact for eternity. Thank you.